Hi, welcome to Amplify's Disability and Inclusion Challenge Q&A session. We are so excited for, to have you all tune in and we'll spend the session to cover any questions that you submitted over the survey a couple of days ago and we're going to dive a bit deeper into the Amplify program and human-centered design. So with that, we're going to get started. I'm Kati, I'm the Amplify program coordinator and I support the Amplify program with all of its operations and challenge management. And with me today, I have Aya, Owen, and Chelsea joining us. And they are gonna share a little bit more about their expertise and involvement they have with Amplify. So I'll leave it with them. Aya? Hey everyone, so my name is Aya and I'm communications designer here at IEO.org with the Amplify program. Um, what that means is that I help organizations articulate and communicate their purpose, uh, their methods and tools, um, and some of my work is internally facing, so I work within the organization and the team um, to help them internally align on what their values are, and what their methods and purpose is, uh, are. <laughs> um, and then uh, some of the work I do with the organizations is externally facing, so I would work with them on specific campaigns and communications and branding that they want to put out into the world to test specific ideas or to communicate with the user group or their target audience, what they're trying to do. Um, and a lot of that starts with actually going into the field and understanding who the user is. And so we do that with research um, and we, uh, I help them synthesize uh, the needs and the wants of that user into articulations that they can then move forward with actionable items uh, for. Owen. Great, uh, thanks Aya. So my name's Owen and I'm a business designer and my role is to find a design that really matches up in that sweet spot between strategy and aesthetic. And uh, there's three real things that I feel a business designer should have in their toolkit. The first is really thinking through a business's or a nonprofit organization's value propositions. So what makes that organization tick and how to get the product or service that they're selling or giving away or providing into the right person or people's hands. Uh, the second is testing, uh, developing, and then testing various revenue models. So oftentimes we work with organizations that even though they're maybe nonprofit, it might be a bit of a social enterprise. So they're looking to build a revenue stream. So we've helped organizations in the past think through who their target customer would be and how to actually create revenue, whether that's selling advertising, whether that's selling the data that you're collecting on your customer or something completely different. And the third thing is thinking through different marketing or sales channels. So the current project I'm on right now, uh, we can talk about it a little later, but we're helping them prototype three different ways of getting their product into the hands of a consumer from a lightweight Facebook advertising campaign to something that's a little bit more intense, which is a try before you buy sales experience. So that's a business designer in a nutshell. Great. Chelsea? Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea, and I'm the challenge manager working with both the Open IDEO and Amplify teams. And so really supporting to manage the challenge process and some support our community of innovators and organizations. Um, and my background has been mainly in global health, working on program management and partnerships um, with nonprofits focused on, you know, making a positive impact in communities at global, regional, local levels. Um, and so what does my role look like? There's a few different things related. Um, internally, I think a lot about what processes do we need to move the challenge forward um, and really work across many different teams, both here at IDEO as well as externally with our group of uh, technical experts that volunteer their time to support this process um, to coordinate everything. Um, and externally, I'm supporting all of you, the organizations that are participating in our challenge process. So a lot of communicating with you, you'll see my name throughout the challenge, um, sharing resources along the way, and hopefully trying to create a really fun and engaging process that allows organizations and ideas to learn um, and collaborate along the way. And so I'm really excited to be working at this intersection of development and human-centered design, and I'm just constantly inspired by um, what I see in the platform, really hard work of organizations around the world. Great, thank you, Chelsea. So with that, we're gonna go a little bit deeper on the how-tos. So Chelsea, why don't you take it away with how to submit an idea? Great, let's do it. I'll be just a moment, share my screen with everyone. Let's 
Perfect. Can you guys see the screen now? No, no. Over time. Not, not quite yet? There it is. Great. We will try that again. <laughs> There we are. See it? Yes. Perfect. Great. So I'm just going to take a few quick moments to walk us through how you can submit an idea on the platform. And the page here that you see right now is the Amplify page on the Open IDEO website. So if you go to openideo.com and you scroll all the way to the bottom of the page at the footer, you can always get back to the Amplify page here. If you're ever lost, um, feel free to find us there. I'm going to scroll quickly all the way back up to the top. This page is where you can find a lot of information about the Amplify program in general. So we encourage you to check it out. It'll also link you to IDEO.org's page about Amplify where you can learn a lot about our um, previous cohorts of winners as well. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this button here that says join us. And so that will take me to another page should be loading right now. Um, this is what we call our challenge brief page. And this is where we store all of the information that we hope will be helpful for you as you think about participating in the challenge. So I won't walk us through everything right now, but if you scroll down, there's a lot of information about the challenge itself, uh, what we're looking for, and how you can participate. So I'm gonna scroll back up to the top and show you, oh, you'll see that a pop-up just came up. It says, follow the challenge. So this is a way that you can enter your email address and be sure that you receive our newsletters and updates about this challenge. I'm already signed up, so I'm gonna go ahead and click out of that. Um, so if you're new to Open IDEO, you probably don't have a profile yet. I'm not gonna get into that here, but you'll see the sign in. Um, if you click on participate in ideas, that's how you can get in and put, add your idea to the platform. This takes you to the ideas page. If you scroll down, you'll see add your idea and it tells you there's 19 days left. If you click on that button, if you're not logged in, it'll take you to the sign in screen. You'll see my information saved here, so I'll just go ahead and log in. If you need to create an account, just click that sign up button. So this is our application page. Um, this is where you can click through. There's a few areas where you select your answer and there's a few where it's freeform text. We'll get into more of what we're really looking for in ideas a bit later on, but I'll just scroll you through here. We're looking for a title, you know, description of your idea, plenty of opportunity to add images and make your idea visual, answer a few specific questions about your idea. And then all the way at the bottom, there's a few multiple choice and, and um, questions where you can give us a little bit more detailed information about who you are. And as you get to the bottom, you'll see you have the opportunity to add other authors, create a team, um, feel free to include others if you have uh, collaborators on the idea. So all you have to do is hit save and publish. Um, you can save it as a draft, which means our community won't see it quite yet. You can do that if you feel more comfortable with it, but we encourage you to just go ahead and publish because you have um, about 19 days left to continue editing your idea. Um, so I'll stop there and hopefully that answers a few questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we can dig into some of the questions we've got. Great, thank you Chelsea. So we're gonna dive into a little bit more about the challenge itself. So Chelsea, what exactly are we looking for in the idea space and what do we need to submit by April 23rd? That is a great question and a really good place for us to start this conversation. Um, this process might be a little bit different than others that you're used to. And so really the simple answer is, we're not really looking for all that much quite yet. What we're mainly looking to understand is just the, you know, the skeleton of your idea and a bit of information about who you are. So uh, we do encourage people that participate to help us understand the basics of their idea and where they're coming from, where it came out of, who their organization is, but really to try to be short and clear in your responses. We really don't need pages of information, which is why you'll notice that there's character limits on all of the questions. We know it can be hard to get responses under the character limits, but it's really meant to help you be successful in the application 
Um, we're really excited when we see organizations able to articulate their idea and who they are in a really strategic and short way. Um, so use the, the guidance that you may have seen on the screen when I shared it. It's in gray text under the questions. That's a little bit more detail about what we're looking for in the question. Um, and so we're pretty transparent about what we want to learn. Uh, use the questions that are in the platform as your guidance. And we do strongly encourage that you read the challenge brief, the evaluation criteria, and the opportunity areas that are on that challenge brief page I showed you. Um, again, we try to be very transparent in what we're looking for, so it's all there. Um, anything we might be you know, assessing your idea on later in the process is all shared in the criteria. Um, so we're excited and, and really in the platform, um, during the ideas phase, like I said, it's really just a place to edit your idea. Nothing will be evaluated until after April 23rd, which is the deadline for the ideas phase. So it's okay to get in there, get a draft going, share it, you can start getting comments. Um, so not too much quite yet at this phase. Cool, so the deadline for the ideas phase is April 23rd. What comes next? What comes after the ideas phase? Great question. So the next step is that we take a step back. Um, you'll notice that there's about two weeks lag time between when you submit your idea and when a short list of ideas is announced. If you check out the evaluation criteria on the challenge brief page, you'll see that we have a list of bullet points about what we're looking for in shortlisted ideas. I won't run through all of them now, but to give you an example, we are looking for new or early stage ideas, um, but that are related to the core competency of your organization or group. We're looking for organizations that have at least one year of experience in their sector and their geographical region and a few other um, criteria as well. So check those out. Uh, we'll spend a bit of time as a team looking through and reviewing all of the great ideas. We'll announce a short list um, after two weeks. After that phase, um, there'll be a feedback, uh, time for you to get into your community and learn and explore your idea. We'll provide you with some um, resources and connect you with some experts. And then you'll have, um, don't worry, two more weeks to um, absorb everything and update your idea with whatever you may have learned after that. Great. And what do you finalists win? Yeah, we do get a lot of questions around that. Um, and again, uh, we do have that information on the Amplify website, both on OpenIDEO and IDEO.org, but to just share some high-level points about what, what you do win if you join our family. Um, there are 18 months of design support, and so that can look like a lot of different things, but it really is technical support in one way or another. Typically, one of our designers will work with you, um, like Aya or Owen, and um, you are also provided with a set of resources to help um, implement and test and prototype pilot your idea. So we do share that it's um, a share of the 500,000 US dollars. And you'll notice that in our challenges, there are typically five to 10 top winning ideas. So if you do the math, that somehow lands usually around 50 to 150,000 per idea, but it's um, really based on a lot of factors. Um, and that whole journey is kicked off by four day boot camp focused on human centered design methodology. Um, our Amplify family and network is super diverse in terms of stage of organization, what type, we've got nonprofits, social enterprises, um, focused on a lot of different areas. So it's really a journey. It's a human-centered design learning journey. Organizations come in with different levels of this methodology. And so we're just really excited about organizations that are, you know, got a cool idea, willing to learn, iterate along the way, um, and we hope to support that journey. Cool. Thank you. And now we're going to take some time to answer the specific questions you asked in this survey. So, Chelsea, Ricardo from Colombia asks, is it possible to propose ideas to this challenge to be implemented in Colombia? How can I participate? Yeah, great question, Ricardo. So, you'll note that on our page, we do share a list of 27 countries that are eligible. Um, if you'd like to post your idea on the platform and collaborate with our community, we definitely encourage that. But unfortunately, we're only able to move forward ideas to the shortlist that are within that set of 27 countries. Um, however, I would love to encourage you to check out OpenIDEO's website. If you click there, there's a tab that says chapters, and we have a chapter in Colombia, actually. So there is a community of folks in your country that you could connect with who might also be thinking about ways to engage with this challenge. Simone asks, is it possible to submit an idea that is a hybrid of the three concentration areas? Can we submit an idea that combines all aspects of these? Yeah, that's a really cool question. Um, yes, definitely is my first answer. 
Um, and I know that in the platform, it does ask you to select just one of those categories. You don't have the option to, to select more than one. So um, it's okay. Just pick the one that feels like it's the best fit and be sure to articulate that throughout your idea to let us know which pieces of the opportunity areas your idea is hoping to address. But I love that and love the intersection across those different opportunity areas. So definitely please participate. One of our participants asks, our product is not yet implemented in one of the priority countries listed, but if we plan to implement in those countries, is that okay? Yes, that's definitely okay. Um, we often work with organizations that have, you know, a strong core competency or area or idea, and they're hoping to move and grow and, and um, apply their idea in new contexts. So um, we see that and definitely apply. Um, we would probably later on look for, you know, are you connected with that community? Do you maybe have partners where you can learn from um, to ensure that, you know, you're thinking about the context that you might be implementing the idea in? But yes, definitely get engaged, submit your idea, and um, that would be a challenge we could help you work through. And then on the open idea submission, do comments and likes matter? Will we be evaluating on that? Mm, interesting question, yeah. So um, we definitely encourage collaboration across contributors. If you're familiar with human-centered design, you know that's a really key and important piece, um, listening to what others have to say, really seeing that diverse perspectives can help your idea grow. Um, however, that said, the number of comments and applauds on your idea are not an evaluation consideration. Um, if we're seeing a lot of excitement from the community and you know, um, you're, getting a, you're collaborating a lot, that might be an indicator to us that you are excited about human-centered design and the values, uh, but that will not be a direct evaluation criteria. Chelsea, great, thank you so much. We're going to turn it to you two, Aya and Owen, for a couple of other questions. So, Aya and Owen, what do we mean about design at IDEO.org? And what types of design support do they both by offer? Great question. Uh, Owen, do you want to start? Sure, happy to. So, we are a human-centered design firm that does a multitude of different design engagements or interventions. It's anywhere from a service design project helping an organization think through how they might implement a completely new service to uh, a, a branding campaign, which I has worked on plenty of those, to, as I mentioned earlier, thinking through potentially a new business model. Actually, um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about some of the projects we had the opportunity to work on. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, one thing I would add to what Owen was saying is that uh, a lot of people think of design, when they hear the word design, they think of graphic design or industrial design or product design, um, specific design um, outputs that designers have put into the world before us. Um, the, the way that human-centered design works is that it understands that people's experiences are usually a combination of all those things. So you may interact with a service that has some core materials and um, job roles, human interaction that you have with the people giving you the service. It also could include um, multiple touch points and, and journeys that you may take across that service. And so the way that we think of design is that we're helping you declutter your plans and your mind and your um, processes so that you could actually um, get down to the core of what you're trying to do for your audience, for your target audience and decide on what are those things that need to be designed, whether they're a process, a service, a business model, a campaign for branding or campaign to spread a specific message. So we try to figure out what that ecosystem looks like with you and then try to implement it and give you the tools and um, the knowledge to go and implement it into the world. So that's sort of the kind of design that we do. It's more on the decluttering and planning um, and then helping you get those actual industrial product um, print materials or whatever they may be uh, out into the world. Um, and so some of the projects that Owen is working on a cool project right now, uh, which includes um, milk chilling and farmers in Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, and actually I is working on it as well. So my role on that project is to think through as this organization goes forth and launches a new product, how might we get that product into the hands of farmers? And so that really allows us to think through the design 
of the sales and marketing campaign, as I mentioned earlier. And unlike some organizations that might just think through, oh, all right, we'll put together a flashy banner, we're thinking about what's the human-centered way to get someone to experience the value of this product before actually having the product in her or his hands. So we've designed a try-before-you-buy experience with, um, with a milk jug and some ice packs uh, and a thermos, and that really allows this consumer to experience chilled milk and the value that it brings before actually committing several hundred dollars to the product itself. Yeah. Also as a part of that, I is working on. Um, so I'm working with uh, Owen and the team on uh, specific materials and information that would be disseminated to the people who are trying to experience this um, product uh, through the different prototypes. And so what kind of information do they need? When do they need it? And how do we reach them and get them interested in this product that we're trying to put out into the world? What resonates with them? Is it uh, the process of making maybe making more milk, giving more milk to the um, uh, processing plants that process the milk into dairy products, or is it that they want to make more money so that their families can have more reserve money to spend on schools or, or other um, um, things that need money in life, which is a lot. Uh, and so what, what is the main thing that drives people to be interested in this kind of product? Um, We've done a lot of research on that, and then we are going to test different materials um, that have different messaging, basically to see what resonates. Um, other projects that include that kind of testing of messaging that we've worked on, um, one of the last projects I worked on was in the Philippines, uh, in an organization that's international, but were uh, establishing themselves or a chapter in the Philippines in Manila, and they work on um, post-disaster um, home construction repairs basically to strengthen the structure of the house so that it withstands disaster in a, in a stronger way, in a better way. And one of the contexts was new. The Philippines was new for them and they were trying to enter communities that they did not know uh, very well. And second, they were trying to shift their models from a post-disaster um, response to a pre-disaster resilience building approach. And so they wanted to approach people before any disaster hits help them strengthen their houses so that when disaster does hit, you're in a better position to withstand it. And so two things that they needed to communicate to people and get them on board. And so we helped them um, go into the community and test out different messaging uh, techniques and campaigns so that they could um, establish themselves within that community and build trust um, and see what, what the community wants to lead with in terms of their needs. Um, and some, product, some projects we've worked on are much more uh, product-based. So the part of what um, Owen's working on is, includes the product itself that chills the milk. Um, another one that I worked on was a product um, in Kenya for chicken farmers. And it was, uh, we, we helped the organization that we were working with basically design that product, build it out there, prototype different materials, um, and then help them uh, basically take it hopefully to market. So they're trying to prototype how to build it um, in the most feasible and viable way possible right now after figuring out that it was desirable for the farmers to have it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. So with all the projects that we've done with social enterprises and NGOs, how would you say that design thinking has helped move the ideas of our partners forward? And do you have any examples from our current portfolio? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, so I think one of the projects that I first worked on when I joined IDEO.org was a, an organization um, based out of Jordan, which is called We Love Reading, and their, their purpose was to help children in the Middle East read for pleasure, um, because children in the Middle East read a lot for educational purposes, religious purposes, but not really just for pleasure. Um, and so the organization was pretty successful within urban settings in Jordan, but wanted to transfer and scale up into refugee settings. So the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan was their first um, uh, touch point that they wanted to enter, and then they wanted to expand to multiple other refugee camps. This is a whole new context that they have not worked in, and you can imagine that working with refugee children is a completely different experience than working with children um, in, in Jordan, in just Amman and other cities. And so we went with them and, and using human-centered design research methods, first understood who the children and who the people are in the Zathari camp, 
what we lead with, what resonates with them, what feels um, important to them in this journey at, at this point in life when they are in limbo. Um, and use understanding this, synthesizing all of these uh, insights and learnings that we got, uh, developed campaigns and materials and training curriculums to help uh, refugees form circles and communities around reading. Um, and then implement the model of, of the organization. And they've been, uh, they've been working in Zatari camp and have scaled to different refugee camps uh, since then. And so it's been a successful model of replication, um, basically using human-centered design. Great, other examples? Uh, sure, I, I think that when we think about a successful engagement with a partner, it really comes down to, are we able to get that team excited about HCD, human-centered design, in a way that we often refer to as the deliverable of an engagement with IDEO.org. We say team as deliverable. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, while maybe one or two of you will be joining us if successful at boot camp, we really are excited for you to take back the values and principles and, and design insights about how to use HCD in your organization and integrate that within the larger organization. And I think this last project we've been on, which is working with a company that works extensively in East Africa and South Asia, but they're based in the Netherlands, how that really demonstrated itself was when we went to their organization, we could see an excitement around human-centered design that was inculcated by the, the two individuals that had gone to our design boot camp. And you saw that excitement really throughout the entire office. So that's something that really gets me jazzed about teaching human-centered design through you exciting new uh, designers. Great, thank you. So our current challenge really focuses on the needs of the people. Can you two tell us why that's so important? Yeah, sure. I mean, so I will draw something for you guys, which is what we all lead with. Um, and it's basically I'm drawing three circles that are intersecting at the center. And the first one says feasible. The other one says viable. And the one that we lead with is set, says desirable. So I'm going to share this with you on the camera, I don't know if you can see it. But basically, any business or product or service or program that exists in the world, all of you think about these things. And a lot of people lead with what's viable. So what is, um, viable is the technology one, right? Viable yeah, yeah. has to do with technology, but also really the, the business as well. Uh, so feasible is the, basically, viable and feasible tackle whether a product or a program um, or a thing that you put out into the world uh, will work from a financial standpoint as a business or whether it would work from a technical standpoint. Do we have the technology in the world today to put out this thing? Those are two of the main things that people lead with. But then the third one that we kind of start from is the desirable circle. So this circle is where the people are. You design something so that others can use it. You put something out into the world so that other people would benefit from it. And if you do not understand whether the people want, need, desire, aspire to this thing or this experience, whatever it may be, then it will never live on. We, we put a lot of things, we've all seen examples of products or services put out into the world that died pretty quickly or slowly because at the end of the day, people didn't latch on to them or need them or want them. And so I think a lot of us lead with intuition and assumptions about, we think we understand that people are trying to do things for, but a lot of the time what human-centered design shows is that we assume so much and we need to go and test out those assumptions. And so we have a lot of tools and methods and mindsets that help us go into the field to understand whether our assumptions were correct. And if they were not, then what are the mm -hmm. core things that drive the people trying to design for in those communities? Um, so I think that's, that's what, what we lead with. If people don't want it, they're never going to want it and use it. That's right. I mean, I'll add, as you go out in the world and really start to formulate your designs, uh, just keep in the back of your mind something that our chief creative officer at our, our sister organization, IO, always says. And he said, I became successful here when I realized I wasn't the cleverest person in the room. Meaning that smart, good design really comes into life when it's informed by a plurality of voices. So I'd encourage you, as you take your idea 
and you stress test it with the end user, the beneficiary, the customer, make sure you go out and do that and get a plurality of different voices so that we know, as, as Aya said, it gets back to that third circle, desirability. Great, thank you, Owen and Aya. And Owen, oh, with that you know, great point, can you tell us about a time where you came up with an idea based off what mm. you learned from people about their needs and it didn't work out? What do you do when that happened? Sure, I mean, I think that the process that can be stressful but also incredibly rewarding with design is that sometimes you have to pivot. Sometimes you have to really iterate. And again, I'll, I'll mention the project that I'm currently working on, which is with a biogas, biogas milk refrigerator. And when we went and spoke to the users of this refrigerator, we realized that while it was targeting a, a message of make more money and keep your milk fresh overnight, so a more livelihood message, what customers and consumers were wanting was a more lifestyle message, which is, hey, this allows you to become a modern farmer. This allows you to cool not only your milk, but other things, vegetables, other foodstuffs. And so that insight, that design insight, allowed us to pivot slightly and realize that the product shouldn't just be focused on making money, but also focus on making that end user uh, comfortable. Mm -hmm. Great, Owen, oh, thank you. Yeah. So Owen and Aya, what advice do you have for people who look at their idea and are unsure about how to get feedback to improve it? And what are some strategies they can use? Um, the one thing and the main thing I would say is that just get out and ask people. Um, a lot of, we spend a lot of time doing desk research and sitting behind desks because we're always afraid of our ideas being judged. But I think um, adding to what Owen said earlier about the plurality of ideas, that's where the idea gets much stronger. And, and if you're designing something for other people, then go out and talk with those other people because they know more about their life than you ever will. And so they will give you all the insights and the knowledge necessary to make this product. Uh, better and be something that they want to have. There's so many tools. Um, you can go on designkit.org, which is um, a, a set where we keep a set of tools and, and prototypes and, um, and uh, processes that you can um, take on and change and, and uh, uh, edit the way that you may want. But basically, they help you go and have better conversations with people. Um, helping people leave the conversation. So if you're having a conversation or, or an interview with people, instead of just asking them, there could be some tools that you could put in front of them so that they can tell you their own story. Maybe they can draw their journey or their daily life from morning till night. And from that, you can understand a lot more about them. Maybe it's about uh, if you're trying to understand what matters to them most, you have a card sort. So a few sets of cards where they can tell you, oh, School for my children is the most important thing. And that will help them be the ones telling the story instead of you deciding, or if you ask a question, is school the most important thing for you? It's very easy for people to say, well, yes, it is very, very important for me. But you kind of just affirmed your own assumption there. So letting, leading any conversation in a way that lets them lead it and tell their perspective is, I think, the best way you could have the conversation. But first of all, go and have it. Hmm. Go and have it, for sure. And as you mentioned, get tactile. So that could take the form of a card sort. You can use your, your inner illustrator skills. But also it could be, for those not as artistically gifted as I am. Your stick figures are amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> but it could, it could include a, a play or a role play activity where you put yourself into the shoes of your end user and actually demonstrate what that interaction might be. You learn a lot by acting something out rather than just writing it down. So I would encourage you to try out a role play as well. And adding to that one final thing is sometimes having an interview with someone in their space is so much more beneficial than having them come to you mm. because you can learn so much from what they've surrounded themselves with. And also, um, leaving some space to not just have a conversation of back and forth of questions, but actually observing them in their daily life. So you could kindly ask them to maybe spend some time with them. Um, they could cook for you or that you could share a meal with them. And you can learn so much about that person and get so many more insights than from just a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation that you have with them. I'll mention one more thing, I know. Sorry, we're going <laughs> off script here. Brainstorming. Uh, uh, yeah, we are brainstorming in a way. <laughs> One thing I find really useful in IDEO and IDEO.org, 
they both do a really good job at it, which is analogous research. And this allows you to build empathy with your customer, your beneficiary, your end user, and uh, in a way that you might not otherwise be able to do. So for instance, the big pivot on our project for the milk chiller, the milk refrigerator, was chilling milk is a new phenomenon. So it's a pivot in someone's lifestyle and livelihood, as we mentioned. So we tried to think of the different pivots in our own life that we could take to feel that almost cataclysmic change that someone might endure. And I'll mention one of them, which is uh, some of our team actually started to drink a, a protein shake, um, Soylent, for uh, I think a week or two uh, as a replacement to meals. So imagine uh, changing something so dramatically as not consuming regular meals, but just drinking your meal. And again, you say, oh, that's not related to milk or milk chilling. True. But what it is, is it's a pivot in your mindset. And by doing these analogous experiences, you really put yourself into that user's shoes. Oh, and Aya, thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank Absolutely. you guys for having us. Good luck. So we have a couple more things just to cover quickly. You may have noticed during this session that we continually refer to our past projects or our ongoing relationships with our partners. And you can read all of those stories on our website at IDEO.org and on Open IDEO. And definitely you can look at previous listed ideas, all of their postings, and more stories to share. So we hope you we have answered all of your questions. And if you have any more, please feel free to email amplify at IDEO.org or send us a message on Open IDEO. So remember the ideas phase is the closing on April 23rd and we will see you in the challenge. So, bye! bye. bye.